I did my business school, I did Sciences Po in Paris, which is a generic uh, uh, French business school, and I wanted to specialize after that in luxury, especially jewelry. So after Sciences Po, I went to New York and I said GIA, so I'm a mm -hmm. GIA graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, then my first job was as a sales assistant, actually at Saks Fifth Avenue uh, in the States. Then I moved back to Paris and there I was hired by Chanel, who were launching their, uh, who had the intention of launching the fine jewelry uh, department. Uh, so I started with them and I actually grew with them. And uh, uh, that was like a 15 year, uh, 14 years exactly uh, experience. Uh, 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 shaping up, inventing, uh, creating, and then developing uh, 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 the jewelry department of a, of a very important luxury company, which was Chanel at the time, and inventing from scratch uh, something totally new. So there, there was the designer, of course, Lawrence Boimer, there was the, the press attaché, who was extremely important, Valérie Dupour, who then became a worldwide uh, press attaché, so she, she, she really grew a lot within the company. Georges Amer, who was in charge of production, and me, who was running a, 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 a kind of like general manager of that small division that grew and grew and actually came up with some new um, new ways of doing jewelry. It was actually an interesting panache of, of, of trying to be modern and create new ways of designing and offering and retailing but at the same time making sure that because it was Chanel it was done in the proper ways and extremely uh, luxurious and, 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 and in a proper manner. If we are going to be jewelers it has to be well done it can't be uh, not well done so that there was uh, there was the brief given by the owners of the brand at the time which i think we followed rather carefully and uh, today I've, i left the company uh, 10 years ago but today uh, chanel is, is is doing very very well it's jewelry department watch and jewelry department is doing extremely well it's, it's a multi-million uh, dollar business and uh, 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 well represented worldwide with lots of events and then a great great client client base so uh, i know i know they're doing very well so that's after Chanel, I was hired, I was poached actually to go and work for Sotheby's, uh, who had cre created a new department, who had planned to create a new department called Sotheby's Diamonds, where they're in association with an important uh, diamond uh, 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 dealer, a uh, diamond cutter and dealer, they wanted to launch a retail operation where they, they would sell, uh, we would sell diamond jewelry to the Sotheby's clients and other clients. And so we, once again we started from scratch, uh, from the collection, the whole marketing, uh, positioning, etc, etc. And starting, uh, we signed with a designer, James Gilmanchi, who designed some fabulous pieces. And uh, unfortunately I left the company rather quickly, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, mostly strategic reasons. And uh, I then went to work for De Beers in Japan. So uh, I was in charge of De Beers Diamond Jewelers, so the subsidiary of LVMH and De Beers Diamond Mines. And uh, I run that show for uh, three years uh, uh, for Asia, uh, 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 running the show in Japan, opening Taiwan, trying to open China, it was a bit difficult, and uh, Hong Kong and di different places like that. And then um, I was 45, I decided I had enough of the corporate world, which I thought was becoming more and more complicated and didn't have the carte blanche I used to have and, and all the freedom and, 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 and the possibilities that were given once upon a time to some executives in their companies. So I decided to quit the corporate world and actually launch my own little company, which I've been running now for four years called Maison Au Clair and basically uh, I decided to be very niche. If you don't have the means you have to be very niche and uh, the idea I had at the time was actually to, to, to take an old behavior in the jewelry business which is called bijou de remploi. I mean you re-employ uh, uh, antiquities and mount them on modern uh, mountings, mo modern jewelry mountings which has been done for the last since, since uh, middle ages but the specificity was that in my store you would only find such pieces of jewellery. So you do find such jewellery at Cartier in the 30s, at Bulgari with the Monette collections and things like that, but uh, 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 you don't, do, you don't uh, uh, find it anymore nowadays. So you, you do find them like that, but I wanted to make sure that we would have this as, as a main uh, offer. So that was the niche of it. 
and uh, it's been going for four years and it's growing, growing steadily and nicely and uh, 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 having lots of fun buying, which is the, the, the most interesting part, uh, buying the antiquities, so their coins, their, their gold parts, they, they can be uh, Greek or Roman, they can be Mesopotamian, they can be uh, Middle Ages, they can be 18th century, they can be 20th century, uh, buying mostly from uh, auction houses, from antique dealers, from collectioners, though I try to privilege uh, auction houses actually because the provenance of them is always very certified, which is quite important nowadays. And uh, with those antiques, draw around them, and uh, all the pieces are one of a kind. Bring them to the workshop. I use five workshops in Paris, and uh, create a one of a kind pieces of jewelry, retailing between 5,000 to 50,000 euros. So a rather precise bracket, which is a, a real jewelry, but not too expensive. It's not Place Vendôme gem encrusted uh, uh, pieces of jewellery. It's more uh, 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 what I call affordable high-end jewellery. That's exactly the position. But I think, un unlike the other houses, your pieces are impossible to copy. Your concept is maybe possible to copy, except that people don't have the knowledge that you have of antiquities, which is since your exactly. grandfather... Exactly. And on the piece side, if, if you want to copy the piece, you have to copy the antiquity. So, so you have to be, uh, 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 to be able to falsify antiques and then falsify pieces of jewellery. So to falsify would be very difficult because of that. And also, don't forget, you only falsify uh, uh, pieces of jewellery that are well known. So series, for instance, marketed jewellery, what I call marketing jewellery, uh, uh, such ring from such company, such watch from such company, the, those are the things you're going to copy because they're well known. Here we do exactly the contrary of that, we don't want well known pieces, we want one of a kind pieces, so to copy that would be rather uh, intriguing yeah. economically, first point. And, and then the second point you raised, which is very important, is the knowledge. Uh, yes, it's important to know about uh, uh, many different cultures, their artifacts, what they've been doing and not doing, and be able to, 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 to test, to, to, to authentify and things like that. But also, I rely massively on network, on my friends. So I see a piece I think is very uh, interesting, I think aesthetically it's lovely. It is durable and it is possible to mount it as a piece of jewellery, but if I have a doubt, I go and see friends who are experts and tell them, what do you think of this? And then they'll, they'll give me their, 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 their guarantee or not. Yeah, so, yeah. Exactly. You, you, you can't know everything in all fields. What's important is to know someone that will know for you and that you can ask uh, uh, on, a, on a friend's case. Right, right. Because my privileged era right now, and which has been the case for the last few years, is actually Greek and Roman artifacts. That's really what I like. Fifth century before up to third, fourth century uh, after uh, Jesus Christ. So that that's my preferred uh, 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 period because the artifacts are gorgeous, they're very beautiful, the, the, the production is always uh, very, very interesting, and the patina of pieces that are at least 2,000 years old is extremely gorgeous and, 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 and makes uh, uh, the pieces of jewellery really work very, very well. But you said even the gold is very different. The, the gold is very different, it's much uh, 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 purer. Uh, Roman gold is much purer. Greek gold can be uh, much more of an alloy. It can go even down to a, what we call electrum, which is like half half gold, half silver, uh, uh, found naturally in riverbeds. But uh, uh, as from Roman times, as as from the first century uh, BC, uh, gold uh, uh, is becoming purer and purer. I mean, the gold is being used for coins or for jewelry making. And, and that is a concern from the Roman state to make sure that the gold they have, they carry, is of the pure quality for, for, for financial and, and economic reasons uh, uh, defined at the time. And as I understand it, the pieces that you purchase, these antique pieces, you make sure that they can't be damaged by what you add Absolutely. to them, right? So when you mount them, it's done in a particular way that you can dismantle them later, is that correct? The, the, the idea and the brief that I've given to all the workshops is whatever we do in terms of mounting, we have to preserve the integrity of the antique piece. Uh, and, and the idea is the following, if a client walks here and says, I do love that piece of antique, 
but I don't give a hoot about your piece of jewelry, please dismount and sell me the center. We are totally able to do that. So, no scratches, no, 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 no gluing, no soldering, of course, no breaking, no, no re piercing. All of these things are not allowed whatsoever. So, a pure, pure protection and preserve, preserve, preservity of, 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 of the center. So that means you would never melt down an old piece because you're respecting no. it too much, even if you find it ugly. Well, if I find it ugly, I don't buy it, so uh, I just right. move away from it. Uh, the only thing that could happen is that I really want the stones on this piece, so I would unset all the stones and use the stones. That, that is totally allowable, but it would have to be a, a 19th or 20th century piece. I was certainly would never do that on a, on a, on a Roman piece, mm -hmm. or a medieval piece, or a Renaissance piece, absolutely not. And uh, would you say also that that's probably what gives your pieces more soul as well, because they have a story already, they're born with a story by the time you meet them, uh, exactly. and then you're just uh, honoring them with some more... <laughs> they're, they're the story, I mean, yeah. you, you can't make more of a story than, than, than those little guys carry, I mean, it, 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 we can go on for hours on each piece, because uh, by the time you explain the coin or the center, by the time you explain its usage, uh, uh, its historical background, and then you move on to the fabrication of the piece, etc., etc., I mean, we could spend a couple of hours on each piece easily. So, yes, yes, yes. But it's quite daring or kind of also cheeky to be playing with these pieces and making them better. I heard about a zizi being added to a piece. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, no, absolutely. It's a daring, audacious, yes. Uh, uh, it's a new type of jewelry. It's, uh, I design jewelry for, for women who have everything. Uh, clientele here is usually uh, rather wealthy, rather international. It's French, European, American, Middle Eastern, starting to have some Asians. Uh, so it's rather international. It's a, a, a woman that really has a lot of stuff and is very amused by this new type of jewelry that she finds extremely interesting because it's a story and its own. She finds easy to wear. Uh, 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 it's not covered with uh, stones or whatever. So it's rather what I call travel jewelry. It's got this side of it. It's practical. It's modern. And uh, 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 she thinks it's rather there's something very modern about it. There's something modern in its volume and in, in the way it's easy to wear, and also in the fact that it's absolutely unique and not marketable. I guess also people who appreciate, obviously they need to appreciate antiques to start off with, so they yes. probably have some knowledge to begin with. Yes. And they trust you yes. and your knowledge. Yes. yes. Um, but most of my clients actually do have a, ge a solid general culture. But what's interesting is that I do have now new clients that do not have what I call Western general culture. Uh, uh, they can be Middle Eastern, they can be Asians, and of course their culture is very, very different from the one I propose here. But what's very interesting is they're always very eager to know and to learn. So for instance, they will say, oh, I do like this piece, do tell me about it, and I will explain the piece. And then they say, okay, great, I'll take it. So it's rather interesting. It's, uh, uh, it's not necessarily having that culture, it's actually being curious of it, which I think is wonderful. Yeah. But when you're speaking, you're saying affordable um, collection. For, for them, it's affordable. You're saying it's under 250,000 euros or something. But what would be affordable? You talk about between 10 and. No, uh, my, my price is between range. 5,000 and 50,000, and the hard, okay. the hard is like 8 to 12,000. Right. So for them, it's very doable jewelry. They, 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 they go and spend much more, or they have spent much more in big stones, for instance, uh, uh, with the usual suspects. So those pieces are, 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 are actually much uh, easier to, 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 to buy. Uh, 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 financially, not aesthetically. Aesthetically, they're, 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 it requires a certain profile, as we, do, as we were just saying. But uh, in terms of money, no, easy, easy. But that means you're for jewelry buyers, not for jewelry buyers. Yeah. I imagine your restriction then is finding the good old pieces. Yes, uh, 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 finding the proper antiquities that that, that, that will be good to mount as, as a piece of jewelry, so there are several levels to it. First of all, it has to be the right uh, origin, the right provenance. Uh, it has to be legal. It's a very important issue. 
Secondly, it has to be very attractive. The, the, the piece in itself has to be very gorgeous. The patina, the design, the, the shape, the volume, etc. has to be uh, very uh, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, thirdly, it has to be durable. Uh, a steatite uh, a cylinder from Egyptian times or, or a scarab from the Egyptian time I cannot mount as a ring. It's too soft, it's too dangerous. So there the durability uh, uh, avoids me from using it. Uh, uh, it has to be uh, uh, settable. The volume has to be uh, um, uh, uh, usable within uh, a ring or a pendant. If it's too large or too small, or too soft, as we were saying, or from a weird provenance, I will not use it. Yeah, yeah it's too risky to take it. And there must be so many dodgy or well, illegal pieces floating around, especially from Greek Roman times. Or Yes, or actually, more from Mesopotamian times. Um, right now, everything that's Syrian uh, and all that culture, you know, okay. from the third millennium BC, uh, is hot, hot, hot. So yeah. obviously, I'm not going to buy from private people. Yeah. I will only buy from uh, from auction houses for that type of merchandise. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to take me through some of the pieces? Yes, yes. yes. So that artifact is actually it's um, it's a pendant. This part here is actually a pendant uh, made out of coral and gold, and you can see the hoop of the pendant here. And it depicts, in fact, a phallus. So you can see the pubic hair, you can see the, 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 the phallus in itself. And uh, this little sculpture was actually a centerpiece for an important necklace, bearing in mind that at the time a phallus w was not a sexual device. It was more of a, a, a symbol of fertility and richness and renewal. You have to think more of spring and, and uh, renaissance of, of the springtime, fertility, that is more what we're talking about than a, a, a sexual uh, a, a symbol as the one we understand today. So actually this piece is extremely moving, what endearing. What is the material, so did you say? Sorry? The material is... What, what material is it? Coral. This is, is coral. Coral. Yeah. this is coral. This is coral and gold, and we've encapsulated it into a uh, secret ring. Okay, Works like this, in the shape of an egg. Because of course nowadays you can't show your ZZ everywhere, so you have to be a bit careful. But the idea is that yes, you, you carry it like that, and once in a while someone is going to ask you, but what's inside? And you can say. It's easy. <laughs> so it's kind of like a, a, a kind of like objet de curiosity, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that's exactly the type of type of whimsical yet chic piece of jewelry that I love to do. So, for instance, there, what we have that's really interesting is the the Manuki uh, uh, bracelet. Uh, this bracelet is made out of two gold buttons. They're Japanese, they're 18th century, and these were buttons that were attached to the swords of the Japanese samurais. So, so they're, they're, they're extremely uh, interesting because they're actually war uh, objects, but on the same time they're very poetic and very, very uh, refined in terms of objects. We have intaglios, 19th century Italios, we have a Roman intaglio on this very intricate ring, and on the bar brooch you have three Roman intaglios. Um, another form of upcycling as well, isn't it? It is upcycling, exactly, why not? <laughs> Uh, um, in this, in this uh, uh, case, where you saw the ZZ ring, which is closed right now, you also have an egg-shaped ring uh, 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 centering a very beautiful Renaissance uh, cameo depicting uh, uh, Venus. And as you can see, she's bare-chested, um, but she's offering a heart on the left uh, with her two hands. And that's very elegant, very nice. Uh, the cross necklace is one of my favorite pieces. It centers on a very important Roman period cameo uh, engraved uh, 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 depicting uh, Medusa. 
And as you know, Medusa petrifies your enemies uh, if she looks at them straight in the eyes. And you can see that Medusa there is not full facing, she's three quarter facing. And that I think is extremely interesting. In this case, you have those very intriguing objects. They're in fact, uh, I don't sell them as jewelry anymore because they're, they're too voluminous and too heavy. They used to be earrings uh, 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 in the good old times in India. Uh, and women would actually uh, 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 unscrew them and the round part behind, that is what would go in the, in the low pole. Uh, these are totally unwearable now, but I sell them as objects because I find them so gorgeous and so modern, even though those, those are like a hundred years old. Then we have some Greek, uh, uh, sorry, some Egyptian uh, uh, glass, very beautiful, first millennium BC, uh, green glass encrusted with color glass, has been surrounded with uh, modern uh, sapphires, as you can see. And on the top, you've got a Mughal turquoise uh, set with gold, uh, a, little a little ruby and little pearls. It's surrounded with uh, green barrels. So green barrels are in between emeralds and aquamarines. And I, I just think that the green menthol color suited perfectly that uh, Mughal turquoise. That's a brooch cum pendant. In this case, you've got a very interesting piece on the top, which is a pendant made out of uh, Berlin iron. Ber in Berlin, at the early, in the early 19th century, artisan would make those beautiful pieces of jewelry or medals. And actually, this series is very important because it was given to the Prussian who would give the gold to the state to uh, 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 finance the wars against Napoleon. So in exchange of their gold, the Prussians would get uh, 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 those tokens made out of iron. So they're very, very gorgeous in terms of quality and also the store there is uh, quite unbelievable. Mountain and silver, black silver with emeralds and little diamonds. And there we've got some antique coins. Um, Greek coins, my favorite one being the one in the middle on the ring. Uh, it's uh, from Boeotia, it's 4th century BC and it depicts a shield. And I just find that the design is ever so uh, uh, modern and graphic. case you've got uh, several important pieces. You've got this ring uh, which is late Roman uh, and it's in gold and in fact it's a button. It's a real garment button that's been mounted as a ring and it depicts Venus and, and where it's very interesting is that Venus is facing, she's full facing and that's typical of late Roman dash Byzantine work and it's, uh, 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 it's been enhanced with two diamonds, rose-cut cognac color uh, 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 diamonds uh, of two carat each. The, the earrings are very beautiful. They're a 5th century BC. They're uh, Achaemenid, which is, if you want, the Persian version of the Greek at the time. And they're all done in granulation. Uh, and they're beautiful and very, very well preserved. The little bars with the diamonds are modern. Uh, the attachments, the loops were ready. Uh, 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 the, 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 the pendants had disappeared. Uh, so I enhanced them with those modern attachments. But the quality of the top part is just unbelievable. And the top piece is once again these are manuki. They're um, they're uh, uh, Japanese uh, 18th century once again by a very important uh, artisan called Teiji Goto, um, and they're in the shape of uh, shishi, uh, lion dogs uh, 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 um, protecting the entrance of uh, heavens. 
So these are very protective, uh, they're very good for you, they look after you, and uh, where they're very beautiful is that they're double shishis. Uh, on each side you can see there's two lion dog heads, uh, so uh, you have four lion shishis. Uh, and, that, that is, uh, and it's centered by a, an opal. Uh, in this uh, case, you've got different interesting pieces. This is very beautiful, I think. It's actually a bead. It's in the shape of, um, of this little trumpet. So the trumpet is very old. It's Thracian, 4th century BC. And it actually was a bead that would like a, a snake one after the other and form a full necklace like that. So that's only one bead out of the whole necklace. Uh, and it's mounted on, on a cage as if it was a stone and then we put a, a diamond in the middle to, uh, to give it a bit of an um, uh, optical effect. There, the top ring is very interesting. It's actually a hair coil. Women in the antiquity would, would wear those kind of coils uh, uh, on the mesh of their hair in order to decorate their hair. And so the top part is actually a, 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 an antique Greek 4th century BC hair coil and it's mounted on a modern ring. Black Mesopotamian seal on the necklace and some beads including some Tibetan Z beads. Uh, 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 that are very popular uh, within our, our uh, Asian, with our Asian friends, and make those very striking, very modern rings. That's a goat eye, exactly. Um, I use lots of crystals. Uh, rock crystal is one of my favorite pe uh, uh, material. Uh, on the big large pendant, all of these rock crystals are Roman, they're from the Roman period and they've been mounted uh, with uh, white golden diamonds. Um, you have a very interesting ring on the top which is actually an intaglio, Roman period intaglio depicting Jupiter and one of our specialties here is that we imprint the intaglio not onto wax but onto gold and actually put the, the, the original intaglio and its impression in gold together on the piece of jewelry. So you really see the fine work that is represented and I think it's rather interesting. So that's what you have on the blue chalcedony on black gold surrounded with grey blue sapphires. You have a beautiful uh, 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 Roman intaglio here. Uh, made out of amethyst with tiny rubies on the side. And, fi and here you also have a piece of rock crystal which is a bead as you can see. You can see the perforation, the drill hole all alongside the, 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 the piece which I think is very daring. The black necklace is interesting, that's, that's a brooch that was a bit damaged, but the, the, the motif was extremely fine. That's 1900s uh, diamonds and that's typical garland uh, 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 decor. And so we took the top of uh, the, the, the head of the brooch and we've uh, encrusted it into a big pendant, modern pendant, that we've enameled in black. So actually that brooch that was a bit boring and a bit grandmother, now is, 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 is a pendant that's much more rock and roll. And uh, the teddy bear there is one of my favorite pieces. That's the oldest piece from the collection, that's 3rd millennium BC, so that's 5,000 years old. And it depicts a bear, as you can see, and it's so interesting because that piece is so old, yet it's so modern. The graphic yeah. is, is so unbelievable, so simple and so strong just one cone, two white circles, and here's your teddy bear. And uh, we've mounted it on a brooch, shoulder brooch exactly, in black gold with diamonds, and the diamonds are all underneath. So you mostly see it when you take it off. What I don't understand is how are you able to keep this jewelry on the pieces and Aren't you scared it's going to fall off because nothing's glued on? Nothing no, well, uh, technically this, this is actually very interesting. Uh, uh, in terms of prong, you've got this. This is a large prong. Okay, so the whole piece rests on this. And then each of those are prongs that actually push the antiquity 
onto the chin rest if you want. So technically it all works with, with tensions and, and push uh, 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 with this big rest. Brilliant. So it's rather simple, yeah, yet, yet you have to come up with it. Yeah, looks like and, a kind of clamp. And, and the back is, is open work, but it's in the shape of a little heart. That's which amazing. I think is rather endearing. And as you can see, the workmanship is, 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 is always very beautiful. We're, we're, we're very careful about that. The, the question is, what, what is luxury tomorrow, you know? Between the huge brands that are overly distributed and we can find everywhere in all the airports, and uh, 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 the new designers that are trying to make things that are like one of a kind and much more niche, you know, where where will the client of tomorrow head towards? I think, I think that's a crucial question. But uh, don't you think you're there already because people are becoming more connoisseur, more knowledgeable, and so they, are, I think the brands at some point, they, when, when they know more, they move away from the brands. I think aspiring nouveau riche will go to 